This video is sponsored by Game Toppers. Turn your own kitchen or dining room table into a premium portable game solution at a fraction of the cost. Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 779. Today we're gonna to talk about Earthborn Rangers. This is the first game from Earthborn Games. And what this is, is a LCG style game, but it also is a big campaign and also in a way a big role playing game. And I'll talk more about that in kind of the review at the end of the video, but this is the first game from Earthborn Games. It's a lot of former Fantasy Flight uh, em uh, Games employees, and it feels generally uh, in, in its core like a, it, like a Arkham LCG, Lord of the Rings LCG, Marvel Champions, kind of in that vein, but it does some things different. Now, the one thing to, get to note before I keep calling it an LCG too much is this is uh, you know a, a big box, one box, you get a ton of stuff in the one box. There's not gonna be like, you know, little mini expansions every month and that kind of thing. It's not that sort of format of a game. Uh, if you wanna call this like the base set, there's way more in this base set than you would get typically in like a Marvel Champions or Arkham or Lord of the Rings style game. Like I said, it comes with like a, one really big campaign. Now, the one thing to let you know up front is the base box, this is what they say, and I kind of agree and disagree. The base box is really for like one to two players, and then if you want to play it with three or four, especially four players, there is an additional set of cards that will flesh out like kind of the deck building, you know, cards that you have for your different characters that you're each playing in the game. And the reason for that is because if I want to use the same card as you in my deck and you want to use it in your deck, well, there's only like one set of those cards to build in. There's not multiple sets for multiple players. Now, if you're playing like different, you know, asymmetric sort of play styles with, you know, character classes, it doesn't really come into play, but I think especially as you get to four players, it might be worth it to get that. And I'll have some more thoughts of that in the review, but that's not necessarily necessary. Probably with four players, you just, you're kind of limited a little bit more in terms of the versatility that you could get into. And you couldn't play basically the same class. You couldn't have two, you know, shepherd explorers in the game unless you had those extra cards. But it's a little bit different of an ecosystem than your typical kind of normal LCG style game. I just want to kind of be upfront with that a little bit. Um, so let's go down to the table. I kind of work through what the game's about, you know, thematically, mechanically, all that kind of stuff. And then we'll jump back up here to give you my thoughts. Okay, so I've got a lot of stuff kind of spread over my table here. You can see a few different things. There's a couple of books. You get a rule book, and then you get like a campaign sort of storybook. And I've got a printout, which you can download from their website. And this is kind of your campaign tracker, which I'll talk more about. It is on the very back of the storybook. And so you can just photocopy that if you want, but they have it available for download and print out there. The game does also come with this map, which I'll show you because you're gonna be traveling around actually uh, over the course of the campaign and your multiple sessions and you kind of keep track of where you sort of end up on your campaign sheet here. And then you've got sort of the play field here, which is if you played you know, any LCGs you're familiar with, you got kind of the player deck that's set up for a single player game and some different cards and other decks that the game's gonna kind of throw at you and interact with you. Then you've also got here some tokens off to the side and then I've got the box open over here. So let's just zoom into the box. So you can see here, there's actually a lot of room. And one interesting thing about this is that they have you kind of build your own insert. There's some of these cardboard things to punch out and fold up. And then some of these here actually have little container types of things. So if I pull this out right, sometimes it gets mixed up with the other cardboard. So I can pull this thing out here and pull these out and set them aside if I want. And this is a really nice thing because you've got a lot of different sort of things that you're going to be pulling from. Uh, so in here, you can see you've got various different locations here. So we have path cards for the swamp in this case. And in this case, we have the ravine, which is what I'm currently got out here. I kind of just took a snapshot. I've played 15 games of this so far. And I just said, let me just set this up. I got to do a video before I get too much further. That's kind of what's out on the table right now. So there's a lot of different like types of terrain locations that you'll get to. And then there's some other ones here. These are uh, sort of like key locations, which we'll talk about. They have this kind of yellow icon at the top. So as you sort of travel around, you'll be building kind of the main deck, the path deck that you're interacting with out of some kind of combination of cards from this section here. 
And then you've got some other missions and location specific, story specific stuff over here. And you will keep track of different player decks and unlocked rewards and stuff over here. I've had, got this kind of organized. And then on this side is where all of like the deck building comes in for the different sort of classes and character types and personalities and that kind of stuff. So if you got that extra set of cards, which I talked about at the intro, you'd basically get a kind of like another set of these to kind of double up everything that's in here. So when you played like a three or a four player game, it's just gonna give you that much extra flexibility. You know, if you wanna use, let's see, the healing touch card and I wanna use it, then we can both use it, that kind of thing. So this is really nice and you can see there's tons of room here for any of the expansions and stuff that are gonna eventually uh, come out for the rest of the game. So the first thing let's talk about here is this map here, which you'll get in the game. And we'll just zoom in a little bit. And we can see basically the area where you are kind of starting off in the game. There is a prologue or like a prelude type of thing. I would recommend folks go through it. My only caveat there is it's a little bit confusing because it tells you to read the rules and then jump into the prologue and then do that. And so there's just like some extra little rules that sort of get in the way they're in the prologue, but you can kind of ignore some of that. And it, what it does is it helps you build your deck of your personality cards and all of your different uh, uh, specialties and backgrounds and all that stuff. So it basically walks you through the deck building process, which you could basically skip you know, later on. And then uh, this is not really a spoiler because it's the first quest. You kind of end up here at this Lone Tree Station. You can see each of these locations that you're going to be traveling to has kind of like an intervening terrain. So if I'm going to go to from Lone Tree Station to Boulder Field, I'll sh shuffle up some woods cards with some uh, special valley cards to go to this type of location. You see it's got kind of the brown diamond there. Or if I'm going from here to White Sky, I'll shuffle up the woods cards with the specific White Sky because it has that key location uh, type of icon there. And so over the course of the campaign and beyond the campaign, you're going to be moving around to a lot of these different areas and interacting with them. The only thing really to note about this is you can see some of these are river spaces and you need to basically kind of unlock a special thing, which I won't spoil, uh, to travel on river. Otherwise you can travel on anything. And then you'll want to have a campaign tracker here. Now you don't need this for the prologue, but once you get done with that, then you can start working into the campaign. Now you could totally skip the campaign if you like, and just kind of wander. I, I wouldn't recommend to do that from the beginning. We'll talk more about that probably in the review part. Now there's a couple of things to see here, and I apologize for kind of the scribble. Here you'll be keeping track of all the days that you've done, and you can see some of these will have little entries in that storybook that you're gonna read. So you're gonna to go to that specific entry when you start your day there. You can see some of these I wrote down because you know certain events and stuff trigger certain things to say, hey, it says go out six days and write this number down. So when you get to that day, then something will have happened whether you wanted it to or not. And to keep track of your current position and the terrain in this spot, any kind of missions or quests you get, you'll write down here, then you'll cross them off as you complete them. And then there's a little spot here for some keywords, uh, which we'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. But it's kind of what you would imagine. It'll say, hey, do you have this keyword written down? Then do X or not. And then if you want, you can write down the rewards here. I've not been writing down any of the rewards because I've just been playing it by myself. You can just use the dividers in the box to kind of stick where your rewards are and that kind of thing. But if you're playing with a lot of people, it might be good to kind of write down all the unlocks here so that you know what you all have access to as they get mixed in and shuffled into various different decks. So that's what the campaign tracker is. And then here we've got basically the play area for uh, you know my particular player here. Now, the first thing, like I said, the prologue is gonna walk you through uh, kind of building your character, building your deck. Now this is the main card here. This is your aspect card here. And so you can see you basically have four different stats. And you just choose this because you kind of get a general feel of what you want your character to be like. As you play the game, you'll kind of understand like, okay, you know, maybe I should have went a different way or whatever. But you're always gonna have a stat that is three, so you take three tokens that match that. And you're always gonna have two other stats that are two, and then one that has a, kind of a level one. So you're gonna have one stat you're really strong at, one you're sort of weak at, and then two you're kind of medium at. So that's your first sort of choice there. And there's a whole deck of these, all these various different options there. And then you're gonna build this deck here. It's a 30 card deck. You can see I've drawn some of them out here. 
and you're going to have three types of cards. So first off, we have these personalities. And these typically don't do a whole lot. They're just basically for these different icons. Because you can see all of these cards, personality or otherwise, have these icons. So these cards you can spend to pay for certain other abilities. And then you can see some of these other cards are, you know, they got more rules text and pictures and stuff, but these personalities are just kind of this abstract symbol and there's one that kind of matches each of the different aspects. And you'll say, take two of each. So there's a mess of these different ones. So when you take a card and add it to your deck, typically you'll take two copies of that and then add it. So you're gonna choose the four different uh, personality cards that you want for the different aspects. There's different cards that go with each aspect. And like I said, these are mostly just used to add to a test when you're trying to add sort of a kind of an attribute. But some of them have little uh, special abilities that kind of go along, but you don't really like ever play these cards just to play them. You're always playing them as a part of the test. And that's what the kind of abilities do. They'll trigger something off the test. Now, the next type of card we have here are, let's see, are these background cards. So you can see on the side here, they have what they are. So we've got the personality and we've got shepherd, which is the background. And then from Shepherd, you can choose to go to, uh, I believe, Explorer or Artificer, right? So you have kind of a branching type of path. So you'll select some cards out of the Shepherd deck and then out of the Explorer deck or the Artificer deck. And then the last thing you're going to do after you kind of build your deck through that process is you're going to take one of two rolls here. And this is going to give you a unique special ability, which is usually an exhaust type of thing like this. And you'll take that. That's kind of your persona. And then you have a little token here, which you'll just put there. And sometimes during the game, this token will be used to place out at different location cards and things like that out onto kind of the main play area to kind of represent an exact sort of precise location that you are. Other times, you're, most of the time, you're just kind of like floating around in the general area. So you could kind of be anywhere, but sometimes it asks you to be in a very specific spot, which is kind of interesting. And once you get this deck built, you'll always draw six cards to start the game. You can take a mulligan. And as you kind of learn the game and learn the deck, you'll want to take advantage of that. When you mulligan, you just choose a number of cards, draw that many cards, and then shuffle everything back up. And so always have these six cards in your hand to start a given session. And then as you play cards, you'll discard them in here. Sometimes you'll get fatigue. And this is kind of like sort of an end game timer. As you do certain actions or certain sort of bad events will happen to you, we'll start to fatigue cards and you'll put these over here face down. So a card to draw off your deck. So at any point that any player in the game goes to draw a card from their deck and they don't have the card, then the game ends. You're too tired to continue and you've got to end the day and then kind of regroup for the next thing. Now there will be uh, certain events or cards that you play or cards out on the table that will allow you to soothe or kind of heal your fatigue. At that point, you'll say like, you know, soothe two. So you'll take two cards off the fatigue, add these right into your hands. They're not definitely gone for good. And this is kind of a mechanic that you can kind of play with a little bit there. Now as other things will give you a wound. So when you get a wound, you'll put a little token like that onto your character. Whenever you take a wound, you'll take however many cards are in your fatigue deck, take them all and then discard them. So they're now gone and you've got a wound. If you ever get three wounds, that will also end the day at the end of the turn. And if you ever end the day like that, because you've got three wounds, then there is a sort of a persistent wound card that gets shuffled in on top of your 30 cards. And there's an action, they're all the same. It's basically just gives you kind of a dead card that you kind of have to interact with to remove that and kind of heal up and rest up from that wound uh, to get rid of it from your deck. Otherwise you have that permanently in your deck. So that's one of the two bad ways that the day will end. The other way the day will end, your session will end, is if you ever travel, and I'll explain what traveling is. So if you ever basically move from one location to the next, you can choose to keep going and you just keep going. And sometimes you're trying to blitz all over the map but you're kind of watching this deck here to see how low it's getting to see if you have kind of the time or the energy, so to speak, to get through the deck and keep traveling so you can keep going or you can decide to camp. If you camp, then at that point you can do some deck building. So any rewards cards that you've unlocked, any cards that maybe you swapped out of your deck that you want to swap back in, you can make those adjustments if you decide to camp. Otherwise, then you can't do that. So if you get injured or fatigued, you can't do that kind of inventory swap. 
And if you camp, you know, you write stuff down on the tracker or just camp and then keep going from there. And then you'll basically reset everything. Your deck will reset. Otherwise, if you keep going, you're just going based off of what you've got here. Uh, and sometimes a mission will say end the day, or let's see if I can find a good example here. Sometimes uh, these characters will come out and most of the time they're friendly in this particular case. And so if you allow them to get injured and basically cleared or knocked out, of the game area, sometimes that will end the day because you will sort of be required to sort of tend to them. Because these friendly people, you know, they're on your team, so to speak. You don't want them to get injured. So sometimes that will preemptively end the day on you as well. So you got to watch out for that. So that was the play area. This is kind of the main game area here as from the, your point of view, let's say, as the player. And so there's a few sort of sort of layers to this thing, right? So you have cards that will be right in front of you. This is within reach. And when one of these path cards comes out, you can see an arrow here. So if it's got the down arrow, that means it's going to come right in front of you. This is going to be for you to kind of interact with. And then this is along the way, if it has an up arrow like that. So that's going to be kind of a step away, a little bit further away from you uh, than that you can interact with. And that's going to go up here. And then up here, you're going to have, this is, for example, the location that I'm trying to travel to. And if you played like, you know, the Lord of the Rings card game or any of those kind of card games, you're trying to make basically move along and put success tokens, not those tokens, these tokens on there. And if at the end of a turn you have enough, and you can see if I zoom in, then that four R beats basically four per player. So if we're playing a two player game, you would need eight tokens on there. Single player, you just need four. And so here, let's say I got the five tokens. At the end of my turn, then I can choose if I want to travel or I can keep playing in this region. Sometimes you're looking for something or trying to do something in a, in a particular spot. So you don't just want to move on and travel right away. You still got stuff to do. But once you have the tokens there, then at any point at the end of your turn, you're ready to travel. And then you can travel and choose to uh, go to a new location. Now this card over here, this is the weather card and there's always weather in the game. There's various different types of weather. The weather will change. The weather will affect parts of the gameplay. You can see currently it's howling winds. So once some certain things happens there, then I'll flip that over. That will be a thunderhead. Something else will happen to flip that back. So this will go back and forth. So the weather will always kind of oscillate between two different states there. And if we take a look here at the campaign tracker, you can see you've got the kind of suggested weather for the campaign as you move along. And so that's how the weather will start for these days. And then it could oscillate back and forth between, you know, the two options there on the card. And it is also worth knowing that if you want to play with the difficulty, you can just make this weather harder and harder and harder. And I believe the, the most egregious difficulties like an electric storm, uh, that's just, you know, insanity. So that's the weather. And then over here on the side, we have some mission cards, which I'm not going to show you because they they're not spoilerly, but so currently I've got kind of three missions that I'm juggling. Uh, for the most part, you have like one or maybe two story missions that's going on at the same time. And then you have some side quest stuff that you can kind of do, you know, if you happen to do something, you know, something might happen. Um, sometimes these mission decks here or some of the story events here in the storybook, um, they will affect change in this path card deck. So that's what these two decks are here. They've got the path card deck and the challenge deck. And so these are the things that you're going to be interacting with. Those things that I showed you there, which can be within reach. So you've got some boulders, you've got, um, I'll have to reshuffle this, but here's a friendly kind of character who keeps seeming to come up on me. You know, sort of different foliage and things, um, you know, different sort of predators and prey will be around. Some of these are just nasty monsters. Some of them are friendly-ish creatures. Um, you know, different events and stuff. So the weather, for example, s shuffled that in. Uh, you can see some of these have a little storybook element. So this is how one way you might get a side quest, for example, not necessarily with this guy, but you go here and read that and then there'll be there's certain things you can do with them that will then trigger and eventually maybe it will give you some kind of mission or something to go on related to that character here. And you can see the art's just really cool. So all of that stuff, the terrain, the location that you're traveling to, some mission card story elements will kind of build that path deck for you. And that's the stuff you'll be interacting with. And sometimes you might just want to travel as fast as you can. Because if we look here, let's say we started here at Lone Tree Station, but we need to for our kind of a main quest to get like, you know, way over here. So we don't really want to dilly dally because, you know, there might be some urgency to that mission that we're trying to complete. So we're trying to just grind through this uh, travel 
event location and try to get there and then just get to the next point reset the deck for the new location that we're at and so on and now what these challenge cards are these look very similar to the aspect cards so anytime you do a test you're going to flip a card off the top of this deck and based on the aspect that you're testing you're either going to modify it or not based on the number that's up so if i was trying to do a spirit test it would reduce whatever you know my effort was by one. Or if I was doing a fitness test, I would plus one and these would not uh, affect it. Now at the bottom of these, they all have one of three different icons and colors. You've got this little red winged thing, a blue mountain and a yellow sun. So when you finish resolving your test, which I'll talk about, then you're gonna walk down starting farther away from you and then getting closer and resolving these events on these cards so let's just flip this one here so this is a sun and so this weather card has an event that's going to happen so that's going to happen first and we're going to do that event and then we're going to get here to along the way further away from you nothing happens there there's nobody with an event there that matches the sun and then we're going to get within reach and then in this case we're going to move this guy this reclaimer seeker and it says move this predator when something says to move you just basically move it either you know where it's not if it's here you move it there if it's there you move it here and if we had flipped over another card, let's see, there's a mountain one. So that would do different things based on that. So anytime you do a test, you're always flipping a card here. And there's always going to be a reaction to you, the player, from the game itself. There is no like hero phase and then enemy phase in this game. And I'll save some of this for the review part. But this is one of the coolest things that I've seen. Because the behaviors that are possible on all the different types of creatures and just weird fauna and plant life and the environment and all that stuff happening out here on this board is one of the coolest parts of the game because you always have to be kind of aware of that like okay this creature could do a certain type of thing and you know it could behave in a certain kind of way and things out here can interact with each other so predator might hunt prey or you know friendly characters might come out and help you try to deal with a predator or all kinds of different little interactions. So as you're doing things, this world is happening basically simultaneously with you, which is really cool. All right, so what does your turn look like? So at the start of the game, usually on the back of these location cards, it gives you kind of some setup stuff and some storybook stuff to read. And then everybody will draw a path card and stick it in front of them. And then when it's your turn, the first thing you always do is draw a path card. So if we did this start of my turn here, we can see this is going to end up close to us within reach. So we'll just put that down there. And then everybody's going to do turns. It's just very simple, discreet. I do an action, you do an action, you do an action. It just goes around the table. Everybody does actions. And you have one of three actions. Now the first thing you can do is play a card. And you can see there's a cost here. So the personality cards don't have a cost because you never really play them. You always play them as part of a test. So if I wanted to play out this Orlin hiking staff, I could play that out here, put this down here next to my character, and you can see this has a cost of two. So that would cost me two fitness. So the first thing I do is I would just spend that and I got that. So now if I wanted to do a fitness test, which I'll show you, there could be tests out here on the board that ask me to do a fitness test, or I might have a card here, for example. This one has a fitness test, plus you can add these icons, and then you can strike. So now I've only got one. So I could spend one, and there are basic common tests that you can do. So for example, if I wanted to travel, try to traverse that location, and add some success markers, you always, when you do a test, have to spend at least one here. You can't just spend zero and then add on to it because like, you know, some of these tests require this icon, for example. So I couldn't just spend zero and then add on icons. You always got to have at least one, you know, point to spend and then you can add on above that. And so maybe I played a card, next turn I tried some test, next turn I did another test with this, and then I did this and then so on. So when the next thing you can do, you can play a card, do a test, or you can rest. Now, nothing usually happens when you rest, but if you have an injury on you, then you will take a fatigue for each injury every time you rest. Then once all the players have finished their turn, then you can all choose if you want to travel, if you have enough success tokens on travel card. If you don't travel, fine. And then either way, if you travel or not, you're gonna refresh, which is you're gonna ready cards. So some cards you might tap, some of these cards might, out here might get exhausted or tapped. Everything's gonna ready back up. 
you're going to refill your energy pools here. And then everybody's going to draw a card off the deck. So always get to draw a card. And then you're going to go again, draw a path card, take actions, then rest. Everybody rests. You travel, refresh, so on. You keep going until one of the end game conditions happens where you get fatigued or injured or complete a mission or decide to camp. Now there's a lot of stuff going on here with a lot of the cards. There's a lot to get kind of mired into. One of the neat things about this is you have the equipment. You can see this is how many slots it takes. You can have up to five slots worth of equipment. So I've already eaten up two. If I had played out this whistle here, that would eat up another one and so on. Um, sometimes they'll come here. Any of these cards will come up with these sort of generic token things. So this has three strides on it. So this token here is the generic tokens. I've just put three of these on there. And so these can get used. And as I use them, they'll start to come off. So this will basically like deactivate one of the abilities with this card. You won't be able to do it anymore. And you have two copies of every card in the deck. Other cards, like I said, you can play to beef up the test. So you kind of ignore the text on the card. So if I was trying a spirit test, so this is to connect with a creature, which I'll show you. So I could spend one spirit and then I can also spend any cards with hearts. So I can then discard these two cards, even though they have other abilities, I'll forego those for now. So now I'd have a total of three spirit, you know, going, going to my test there. And then there are other cards here, one of these had that, where you can have a response. So I can play this as a response. Again, the cost here is one spirit. So you have to kind of figure out how you want to spend your spirit in that case. And then you've got other cards, like this is a reward card, but nobody will know what it means. Um, lots of icons. You can attach this to features out on the main board. And there's just a ton of stuff here to kind of learn and interact with and play with. Now, when you interact with any card out here, you can interact with any card you want, but you're going to suffer fatigue if you interact with something kind of too far away usually. So if we interact with one of these cards in front of us, no problem, no fatigue. But you can see each of these has a threshold here in the upper right. And all cards basically have this that come out of the path deck. So let's say for some reason I had exhausted this one, either through some ability or something else caused it to exhaust. And I really wanted to deal with this Reclamer polyp here. So this is, I have to go through this you know, area closest to me and then interact with this card, but I still have this one threshold here. So unless there's some way to deal with this, which my character has, but let's pretend they don't, then I'm going to suffer fatigue and take and discard that into my fatigue stack. Cause I want to, I want, I don't want to mess with this. I want to get right to this and start dealing with that, but that's going to cause me fatigue. Now, both of these were up. That would cost me three total because one plus two is three. But if neither of these was here, then I could get to this free and clear, no fatigue. And the same if I want to try to do, for example, interact with the location up there, because if I'm trying to do a traverse and sort of get away from this place, stuff's gonna kind of keep coming out to get in my way. Now, sometimes there'll be a card here that says obstacle on it, and that's gonna completely block you from getting anywhere past it, and you can't travel. Even if you've previously got enough uh, success tokens on the location. If an obstacle comes out, you can't move now. That's disabled your ability to travel at the end of the turn. You got to deal with that obstacle first. And on some other cards, you know, and effects and stuff like that will give you injuries or fatigue that you have to try to deal with and, and try to heal up from. And again, when you take a test, you always flip this card and then do the modifier and then, you know, trigger any events there. Oh, if you see this, then you just reshuffle the challenge deck there. Now, when you deal with any cards out here, from this path deck, there's always gonna be two numbers to deal with and a bunch of keywords and other stuff, you know, but there's always kind of this harm effect and then like a progress effect. And that's what these two numbers are. So what it kind of symbolizes here is you sort of dealing with something, let's just say like violently or aggressively or dealing with something in sort of a more, you know, naturalistic sort of diplomatic type of way. Now, if you get success tokens, you'll start to, you know, pile these up and you can see these, these two guys here, they don't really want to be bargained with because their threshold on the progress is seven and nine, where if you just punch them in the face, it's two and it's four. So it's going to take you a lot longer to deal with these in a way to basically get them cleared. Cause once you hit the maximum uh, threshold there, either with progress or harm, if I started to stack up some, like, let's say damage on this guy, 
then it's going to clear once you hit that either of those numbers. So once I get to four of these or nine of those, it's cleared and then you can get it out of the way. So what it does is it gives you sort of multiple ways to kind of approach different situations. And some of these cards, like I said, will interact with each other and sort of add and sometimes remove these tokens based on that. So you might get some like field of berries that distracts a deer and the deer is going to go eat it. And so what that's going to do is put a harm token on the field of berries card. And if it gets enough of those, then it's going to disappear and it's going to put some progress tokens on the deer. And once it gets enough of those, it's satisfied, it's eaten what it wants, and then it's going to go away. So sometimes stuff will clear just based on kind of the natural every, everyday activities. So again, you're going to be playing cards, taking tests. You've got the four common tests here, which is just going to help you interact with stuff in a real basic way out here, travel, try to, you know, be friendly with the locals, draw cards off your deck and stuff like that. And you just keep playing until kind of you run out of steam or the game forces you to run out of steam, either through going through your deck or getting too injured or, you know, a story event mission type of thing happens and causes you to end the game. And then we'll talk more about, I'm going to break from here, go to the talking head. We'll talk more about like how the campaign stuff works and how the role playing stuff works. But this is the mechanics that you're going to be dealing with. Okay, so that is Earthborn Rangers. We'll just jump right into my three pillars of review. First, we'll talk about player count. Now, I've only played this solo, and it is absolutely amazing solo. Love it. Very immersive, lots of cool narrative stuff to pull on, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But it's just really involving as a solo experience. However, I would say, having played about 15 games of this so far, that I would really like to play it with other players. And I kind of actually feel like I'm missing out a little bit sharing this experience with others because there's just a lot of little threads to pull on that it would be neat to have other people around to kind of explore things in a different way and have a little bit of the asymmetry in the different sort of class types and that kind of stuff in dealing with situations in different ways. Um, I don't know that I would play it with a full four players. It would take a little bit long, maybe. I'm not sure. But if you had the right you know, group, I think it would be perfectly fine all the way up to four players. Um, but as a solo experience, it's great. Now that leads me into play time. I think the box says like an hour per player. And I don't really know how to talk about the play time, honestly, because that sounds like a lot. <laughs> you know, if you're playing with four players, it would be four hours. But the way the sessions can go, you can almost play as short or as long as you want to play. Because if you're traveling, let's say from point A, point A to point B, then, you know, if point B is across the map, that's going to take a while, maybe multiple days in the terms of the game system. But sometimes you're like blitzing through, you know, the location. So you're, you're not at a location very long. So a single location could take, you know, 10 minutes. And depending on how many obstacles are getting your way and how you can get around them. But other locations, maybe where it's kind of the main location or just somewhere you want to spend more time, you could spend a good solid hour in there and just be you know, digging through that path deck. And when you finish out a day or finish a mission or you camp, I mean, who's to say you can't just pick up and play again? And there might be certain instances based on the kind of the cadence of the game where you're like, okay, we, we got through these couple of things, let's camp and then we'll play again. And we'll kind of reset everybody's decks and keep going. So that's going to vary. Now I've sat and played, you know, multiple day sessions at a time, you know, in one sitting. So I would say, if you ask me what the play time is, I would say one hour to six hours. <laughs> but this depends on what you want to do. If you want to play that long, then you can play that long. And I definitely have done that. Um, so it's a little tricky to talk about play time in this sense, because the game is kind of open-ended, which we're going to talk about now. So my last pillar of review is, you know, what is this game like? Well, obviously I mentioned earlier, Arkham, Lord of the Rings, Marvel Champions, those LCGs. But to me, and this is kind of the brunt of the review, this takes all that to the next level. I absolutely love this game. I adore it in every which way. It's fantastic. I love it. So there's two parts of that though. One is the mechanical side, which I love, and the other is kind of the campaign role-playing side of it. So let's talk about mechanically why I think this is so cool. Oh, I talk about this in the uh, uh, the, the walkthrough piece and I love the reactions part of it so anytime you do a test you flip the challenge deck it modifies your effort on the test and then it triggers possibly some events on the cards that the game has you know put out in the play area so every time the players do a test the game is reacting 
And like I said in the walkthrough, there's no hero phase and then enemy phase, and hero phase and then enemy phase. Every time the players are doing something, or most times the players are doing something, the game is reacting at the same time. So it almost feels like simultaneous. And the way the things interact on the game space is sometimes they react to you, they interact with each other, with other things, the mission stuff will interact in different ways. And that just adds so much life and vibrance to the game. It feels like you're traveling through this world and how the different things interact. And that is just awesome. I absolutely love every part of that. And it's been really interesting over the course of this campaign to see some of the, you know, kind of the clever little ways that they can, you know, put card mechanics together to make you, you know, look at things in different ways and use abilities in different ways over the course of the thing. And it just feels so immersive. And I absolutely love that. Now, the other part of it is probably even more mechanically is you have got the four different stats, you know, spirit and fitness and all the different things. But then you've got like the cards that you can sort of play for their icons to beef up a test or something. And it's a real like crunch sometimes to figure out, ah, you know, I got this card. I want to kind of, maybe it's a nice piece of equipment, but man, I really should be trying to get this test and get through this obstacle or this terrain piece or location. Cause if I dilly dally too much, you know, it's going to be a problem, but I, this is going to be nice to have for the future. You know, as we travel to the next location, I'm going to really want this piece of equipment down because I kind of have an idea of what I think I might be doing. And so that kind of decision space is just really cool and really crunchy and just a lot of fun. And it has all of those best like card hand management things in spades. Uh, really like in, in a way, like a lot better even than some of these other LCGs I mentioned. Like it's just, and I enjoy all of those things I just mentioned uh, a bit ago, but it just feels a little bit more like you are in tune with a with a sort of a, a underlying substrate of pace of of timing over a longer period of time over like a, a little bit more of an arc because like i said you sometimes you're racing through locations sometimes you're pausing sometimes you're trying to get a task done and do a thing and there's there might be like a little sort of signpost on the campaign tracker you're like well i'm pretty sure we need to get something done by six days from now <laughs> because of the way the story's hinting you know and then so that kind of plays into your whole thought process where you're like no no you're like i'm just trying to focus on this this beast in front of me or this little npc type character that i'm interacting with like how i'm trying to keep the weight of the decision of the moment in you know in parallel with kind of the overall like strategy and the main goal so that little piece of all that stuff, just all of this really meshes together in a cool way. And I love how the weather interacts and that will play with things. And that kind of acts as a little bit of a, you know, a paddle in a way on you to kind of keep you focused and that kind of stuff. And um, a lot of the ways that you kind of deal with, and this will kind of lead into some more of the thematic parts of it, where you see certain characters kind of pop back up and all that kind of stuff and, you know, uh, certain I'm trying not to spoil things here, but certain like locations you go do things. You're like, oh, you know, that was this side quest thing. I can go and maybe do this on the side and, you know, and interact with this in different ways. So this is a big kind of like juggling type of thing, but it never, ever feels fiddly. And I think if you looked at the cards on the table, you might go, look, that's a lot of stuff, you know, but you're never like really tracking anything. You might have some counters, you know, to like, I load up my little special weapon that's got three counters and you spend them, you know, that's the, you know, basic things where you add counters to the weather and the weather card flips and then, you know, re-add counters and goes back the other way. But you're not like really making any calculation to, you know, add up the tokens and it's all very like in an intuitive way. And it's just like, you flip that challenge card and it's like, okay, we're going to activate these three things and the order is very clear and away you go. And then the world has moved, you know, alongside me. So it just does all of this stuff without like next to zero fiddliness. Um, it's it just really, really, really cool how they pulled all that off. Now the next part of it, that's kind of the core loop game mechanics. But what I've really liked is, and I'm almost done with like this main story campaign. And what the game does is start you off with a prologue, which I said is kind of funky. It's a little bit of a barrier, so it's just a little bit tricky. I kind of like half played that because I was more using it as like an exercise to build the deck, which is what it's for. And then you kind of slowly add stuff in, but once you get over that, and then you kind of get into your first sort of main scenario, 
it will basically kick you off on kind of the main quest, although that doesn't happen for a little bit. And you have like the first main quest, which is not a spoiler because it's the very first thing, is you basically have to go deliver baskets of uh, biscuits <laughs> to people. And then the game makes some jokes about it and stuff like that. So it kind of like winds you into it a little bit and it has some really flavorful characters and stuff like that that feel very natural and, and human. Um, and so it just gets you going. And then, at, and then it eventually it kicks you into like the main overall plot storyline, which kind of reveals to you slowly, which is nice. But there's going to be moments in there where you have like, maybe, depending on how you play, you know, some time to be like, oh, what do I do here? Well, I got this side quest. I ran into this character so I can spend some time here. But then you also don't want to dilly dally because it's funny because you might have a nice fat deck, you know, when you start the session off, you're like, oh, I got all the time in the world. <laughs> And then a little bit later, you're like, oh no, I'm going to run out of fatigue. I should have moved over here and did this. And, you know, that kind of stress comes in, which is fun. But then what happens basically is, and this is not really like a spoiler. And I, I think it's important that people know this going in, is that after you finish that sort of main campaign, the game basically just opens up its doors to you. And it gives you these tasks that you, in some cases, won't have any idea necessarily how to go complete it. You'll just have to kind of wander around, follow some of the leads that you've acquired over time, and then kind of, it says, once you kind of complete all these, basically you have completed everything that's in the game, and away you go. And I, if you watch the channel enough, you know I absolutely love that procedural stuff. I like a good narrative story arc, and this can, this one has it, and I like it in plenty of games, but it always feels like once you complete it, it's like, eh, I'm never going to go back to that again. And this really opens up that kind of open up ended gameplay that is just completely misses me in a lot of these other story games. I'm not going to name any of these other games, but I mean, if you watch the channel enough, um, you'll know that like a lot of these kind of story narrative storybook games, I'm just like, I could care less. You know, Oathsworn being one of the, you know, few exceptions as well. Um, but this one really, it just hit me at all the levels because it strikes a perfect balance for me of a kind of a main plot line. And then, hey, you can kind of just go explore this world. And you, when you wake up today and you go out, you're like, what am I going to do? I don't know. Let's do this. Okay. And then just see what life throws at you. And that's, that's how it kind of works. And I actually love love the exploration of that and it just really is what pushes this up to me you know up the list right uh, the game the game of the year games of all time like that is just striking like such a great chord for me that i can explore in in this way and the other side of that is the world thematically that's been created is so cool i think i mentioned this earlier it's like a studio ghibli uh, miyazaki style world where it's like post-apocalyptic but after the apocalypse and after the post-apocalypse, like the world is recovered a little bit. There's lots of nature and weird creatures and somewhat fantastical sort of magical things, but it's very lush and rich and colorful and friendly and warm and not brown and wasted, right? It's just full of stuff, full of life. And I love that theme. And the artwork and stuff really has that Miyazaki vibe where it's just like, this looks really cool. And I'm not like a big like, anime person at all, I like a handful of them, Princess Mononoke, Akira, whatever. There's a handful I really like that are just beyond genre to me. They're just great art. Um, and this is kind of, this strikes all of those right notes. And it's cool because it's not like Fallout, right? There's so many games that are like Fallout and I like Fallout. And it's not like Elf, Dwarf, whatever, you know, Lord of the Rings, Tolkien fantasy. It's this whole other thing, but it still has those like magically warm, colorful, injected moments that are just permeating every part of the game that just sucks you right in. And I love that they did that. So cool. Um, yeah, so I think all of that put together mechanically and thematically and all that stuff is just really knocked this game out of the park for me. And I'm excited to see, I know there's gonna be a game found coming up for a second printing and an expansion. I believe there's like some hero cards. You can get like, you know, a couple extra hero things. And then there's that expansion. Then there's like another kind of story arc, you know, quest thing that you can get. Um, so there you can see, like I think I alluded to at the beginning, the ecosystem is not like this, 
you know, constant spigot LCG style thing. It's like big expansions that you can get. You can, you know, get your money's worth, get meaty um, and, and sink your teeth into. Love all that. Um, and, and some other things, just to kind of note, throw some caveats because I don't want to just like steer everybody wrong necessarily because some other people may not like some parts of it. Um, the first part is not a caveat though. This is, they've done some uh, production techniques to make this like kind of eco-friendly. And so I think for that, if there's any concern about like the quality of the cards and the production and you know the component, the physicalness of the game, I think it looks great. I mean, the insert that they have you kind of build, it's, that's cheap, but it's an insert. <laughs> I don't really care. But the cards are nice, the tokens are nice, everything's nice. I love the artwork. Like this is a really cool, different kind of box cover. I love that. Um, and everything's, you know, the card quality is great. So everything is great there. And I'm, I'm glad that they kind of took that risk with kind of the eco-friendly stuff. Um, and they kind of proven in a way that it could be done in a way that, uh, you know, is, is a good quality production and it feels like a nice, you know, piece of uh, uh, component or product or whatever you want to call it. That's, that's really well done. Uh, the other thing is, like I said, the prologue's a little iffy there and it's kind of a lot. Like I would say this is maybe slightly a step up or two in complexity than Arkham or Marvel Champions. There's just kind of a lot going on and it's kind of, I wouldn't say it's unintuitive, but you almost kind of have to unlearn some things because if you just go into a kind of assuming, oh, it's just like all these other LCGs, because like I've been talking about, the pacing of the story and how you can sometimes just kind of do what you want, I think that can throw people off, but that's absolutely what I love about the game. And you know, there's just some differences there. So it's not a cookie cutter, cut and dry LCG. It's that whole like open the door exploration thing is great because it's, it's so directionless in a way, but the, the game dangles enough little like threads for you to pull on and paths to kind of choose. It just makes it so engaging. But I could kind of see, I think that people, you know, they want to sit down and play a game and just crunch numbers and not really faff around and, you know, try to, they, they don't want to engage the part of their brain where like, oh, yeah, that's the part I love about the game. I'm like, when I have that little kind of window during the campaign and I'm gonna have this big window when I'm almost done with the campaign and I'm just like, oh, well, what's, what do we got here? Who's this character, you know? And then just dealing with that character and figure out how, how you wanna kind of deal with them. Like, do you wanna be more diplomatic with them or, or what? And there are certain characters like that have shown up that, you know, well, there's one, I don't wanna spoil it, but it's a very annoying character. And it's straight up like a total comic relief sort of bobbing, you know, sort of joker that kind of shows up like straight out of, you know, a Studio Ghibli movie. And, and it's like, at one point I was like, maybe we should let that face hugger eat him <laughs> and not deal with him. Because like I said, you know, things interact with each other kind of without your volition. And it's like, well, next time I see this person, I'm going to let them get eaten, maybe. Or, you know, there's been a, this character keeps coming up you know, somehow, just kind of randomly, which is funny. And a lot of times I'm like, hey, get out of the way, get out of the way, you know, just because I'm trying to save the valley, you know. And, and once we get to that, the campaign part of it, then I think there might be like, well, I'm going to drill down on that a little bit more. Like, why? You're so annoying. Like, well, let's deal with this, deal with you. Um, and that is just... That's just really cool. That's just really, really fun. And the, the one thing I can kind of leave you with here is, oh, the other thing I was gonna mention, the, there's some errata on the cards, which is normal. There's a lot of cards in here. And that's not, that part's not too bad. The campaign book has mildly significant errata because there's been a couple of parts in the quest where I'm like, is that right? But the, they have put out like an app-friendly, web-friendly uh, version of the campaign guide. So you can go in there and it has the, the errata sort of integrated with it. And it's it, like, it works fine on the phone. Like it's really easy to go look up. You're like, oh, you know, entry 10.1, you go there and you can just kind of read it there. You don't almost need the book um, in some ways. And so that's nice that they've did that because there is some stuff in the campaign guide that I found that it was just like, that doesn't make sense. And then in the errata, you're like, oh, of course. Okay, got it. And uh, there's just been a couple instances, like nothing deal breaking. It's like, oh, of course, of course it works like that. You know, when you read it, you're like, oh, duh. Um, so there, that's kind of there. Um, <clears throat> that was my other little caveat there. The, um, 
one last caveat is when you are blowing through locations, like sometimes you'll set up the path deck and you'll be like, okay, I'm gonna play. And it feels like, you know, five minutes later, like, oh, we moved on, rebuild the path deck. I don't know, that, uh, I, don't, I don't care. But I was seeing in my little re reviewer brain was triggering, I'm like, I bet some somebody's gonna come cry about that. <laughs> you know, but I'm like, it's not a big deal. It doesn't take that long. It takes a few minutes and it just, it, you can kind of think about the game, like as you're making the deck and shuffling, so. Anyway, that was this one thing that struck me as like, somebody's gonna like make that a con, <laughs> you know? But like, I don't think it's a con, it just is what it is. Um, <clears throat> so the last thing I would say, just to kind of give you a sense of the vibe, is I mentioned Fallout before, and when as I was playing this, I'm like, oh man, this would be such a cool Fallout game. <laughs> but I think, I'm like, I'm glad they didn't, because this is such a fresh theme, because it basically is Fallout, but it's just a different sort of coat of paint. Um, but it'd be cool because I like Fallout. I'd be like, man, this would be rad. And then I was thinking, oh, you know, it'd be even cooler if it was Skyrim. Because <laughs> that's what this game feels like. Because you have that main sort of main quest storyline thing like you have in Skyrim or Oblivion. And, but then you can just well, go do whatever you want. Do all the side quests and, you know, get cool upgrades and all that. And I'm like, that would be great. Because I, well, I played one of the two Skyrim games that are out, which was terrible. And then the other one I looked at, I was like, well, that's not a Skyrim game. That's a chip theory game. <laughs> it didn't seem like a Skyrim game to me. But I'm like, oh man, if they this somehow would map Skyrim onto this and you know tweak the mechanics a little bit and stuff like that, I'd be like, really cool, that'd be sweet. Like a Skyrim LCG card game that's like a campaign, but also just an open-ended role-playing game because that's what Skyrim is, right? The, the, the cool part is, yeah, quest, whatever, that's fine but I love the open-endedness of just kind of seeing what happens. And that's that's what this vibe is here. Just not not like dark and gritty. And it's a world I'd want to be in. Whereas like Fallout and Skyrim, I'm like, I don't want to live there. Because <laughs> unless you're like rich <laughs> in Skyrim, then, you know, that sucks. Who would want to live there? I'd be miserable. <clears throat> but yeah, so this is that same kind of vibe there, but with a nice, more colorful, warm theme. Uh, you know, and I was thinking, hey, man, this would be a cool like dungeon crawl thing. You could have a cool map, and like you could do this whole questy thing. But then I'm like, I don't know. I like this theme. I like this this different theme. It'd be neat to have. You know, I don't know. Um, I was telling one of my uh, buddies about it because um, these these are FFG folks. I'm just kind of going off here, but trying to give you sort of a sense of like uh, you know a metaphor for how this game is is making me my mind go. Um, because these are FFG folks, they used to have a, a gal there named Nikki Valens who did a storybook game that I bounced off of just because I liked it kind of, right? I liked the world it built. I didn't really like the main plot and the mechanics were like pretty okay. But I was like, oh, I'd love to see more of this kind of game. But the best part about that, um, what was it called, L Legacy of Dragonhold, was the world and like the type of fantasy it was. Like it was just kind of like you know, off your normal Tolkien beaten path. And I was like, oh, okay, this is cool. I like some of these characters and the types of people that are here. And I'm like, yeah, we, you know, because she's ex FFG, you know, it'd be cool to kind of get another sort of take on a different, <clears throat> very unique individualized sort of setting like this one is. I think that would be really, really cool. Um, so I think I'm excited. This is, this is cool. I'm excited for the expansion coming out. It's gonna be on GameFound. I'm not sure when or where or what. I know it's coming soon-ish. And I'm excited to see, you know, what these folks uh, put together in the future and, you know, the other kinds of worlds that they maybe kind of explore and stuff. So cannot recommend this enough. Just really pushes a lots of my buttons. So uh, that's it. Thank you.